So I, I guess we should just get going by start by saying like, what was your reaction when you first read the script? Because it's about swinging. I mean, it's about what happens when you're in a relationship and your relationship, you know, sexuality starts to fizzle a little bit. And you want to reclaim the spark and feel young again. But there's swingers, there's sex clubs. What was going through your mind when you first read it? I mean, we do, we try everything in the movie. Uh, but uh, what, well, what was going through my mind when I read it was it, um, it came from Jonas Chernick and um, Sean Garrity, who I had done a movie with 10 years ago called uh, My Awkward Sexual Adventure. And it was presented to me as like a spiritual successor in a way that now we're 10 years older and um, that movie was very much kind of uh, in your 20s and trying to be good at sex and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this one, is you know this married couple who the has lost that spark and um, and they send their kids away to camp for six days and they think oh my god the kids are out of the house we can do it in every room of the house and the minute the kids are gone um, they don't know how to do it and get that spark back that was the premise of it um, but when I read the script what kind of struck me was just like. I laughed out loud on every page. And it's so rare to, I don't, it really is rare to get a script that is just so funny, but in grounded, like it's real, it's so relatable in terms of, I guess, the age we're at now and um, all my friends who have kids. Yeah. I don't have kids, I but. Know. That's why my sex life is amazing. Oh, good. Yeah. good. So. I saw that's actually on a shirt you're saying. It is. It I is. don't have kids. That's why my sex life is amazing. Yeah. I saw that in your Etsy store. Yes. Yeah. But in all seriousness, I mean, that is, it, you say it's rare to have a movie like this. It is, it is rare to have a movie that is so honest about what happens when you're with somebody for so long and sex starts to change yeah. and not, maybe not happen as frequently and you're also missing being young and all that kind of stuff. What conversations did you have? you know, with, with, with the folks behind this movie, with the writer who you're in this movie with, about the situation that you find yourself in? Well, so we didn't have those okay. conversations because right. it was so on the page. Right. It was, I just felt like I read it and I got it. Like, uh, I know what it's like to be in a relationship, a long-term relationship, that things get comfortable. Yeah. And then um, all the things they try to get it back. It was just what felt so good about it was the we didn't have to have any like difficult conversations or trying to figure it out. It was so clear, um, which I think is what's so nice about the movie. It's like easy to watch in a way that like you don't have to think; you just have to laugh. No, right. I, I tell you what I liked about it was that I, you know when I th when I thought. When I realized kind of what the movie was going to be about, there was a part of me that was wondering, okay, well, are they going to make fun of people who are involved in, like, you know, more daring or, you know, non-traditional sexual activities? There you go. But you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yes. non-traditional heteronormative sexual activities. Sexual activities. <laughs> Again, like, the, the swingers, sex clubs, um, yeah. various kinks that people are interested in. Mm -hmm. I feel like this movie might not have been able to be made 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Like, do you feel like there's been a lack of this kind of conversations you're having in this movie yeah, on the big screen? That's actually a really good point. I don't, I think you're right. I don't think it would have been made in the same generous and open way. I think yeah. it would have been judgy on those things if it had been made 10 years ago. I think um, what's great about this couple is that they go into these things like, okay, well, let's try a threesome. Um, let's, let's, do the ecstasy mm -hmm. to try to do the sex. Yeah, um, let's go to the group sex room. Yeah. And I was there watching going, like, I'm more interested to see how this plays out rather than watching and going, like, boo. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know? Well, actually, that is a, you're, that brings up a good point. I lied, and I didn't realize I was lying, but we did have conversations about, I just wanted to make sure that the sex in it that I was reading was, like, Real funny. Yeah, and, you um, wanted the sex to be kind of real. And, real and real sex can be funny. Yeah. and funny. And yeah. yeah, and so to never get in. So like when we go into the sex club, um, I didn't want distracting penises everywhere. Yeah. Non-distracting penises. Yeah, right, right. We, yeah. we got taken off the CBC about Okay, like, yeah, a long time ago, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, are, are you, why, why, why was that important to you? 
Um, tone. Tone is everything, I right. think. And to me, the tone of this movie was really clear, but on this line where it can cross into either you can go over the top with it or you can go kind of too too real indie movie with it. And this hit, this perfect, like, I, I kind of don't know any other way to say this, but like big movie that you just enjoy. Yeah. And I don't see a lot of those being made anymore. I think it's more like, I mean, unless it's, no, actually, no, they're not being made. There's Marvel stuff being made. Yeah. There's indie family dramas. But there's not, like, a funny, like, this is 40 or knocked up or, like, that kind of R-rated stuff. R-rated sex yeah. comedy, which is just kind of fun. Yeah. I think this movie can give people who may be struggling with something in their married life or maybe struggling with something, being open about something, a, pre- a preference that they have, it gives them permission to live openly as who they are either with their partner or with somebody else. And I know from knowing what I do about you from reading and from watching it in the Schitt's Creek show that you had a similar experience on Schitt's Creek, if I'm not mistaken, where you were in an episode which allowed you to live more openly. Am I right about that? Yes. Um, It was the... A uh, wine episode, I'll call it that, um, and I think it allowed a lot of people to to see themselves in in this wine metaphor. Can, can, can you say yeah. what? Say what happened? Which um, so David, played by Dan Levy, is explaining to Stevie his sexuality, and he's using wine as the metaphor, and he says he's just he's not he's into the wine, not the label, and. Um, it was just, well, first of all, I'd never heard the word pansexuality before. I didn't even, he said he was pansexual, and I had no idea in my real Emily life what that meant. Yeah, I didn't know that there was kind of something that described how I feel, which is I legitimately just fall for a person, and um, their gender just really doesn't, it's not that it doesn't matter to me. It's the whole, that's not the thing I fall for. And once I've fallen for the person, then I'm just into them. What What is that like to have that experience while doing a scripted, presumably, you know, comedy TV show? Well, I think there was, it was a perfect storm of things. For you. Of, yeah, I think I'd been in, I'd been married. I was out of a relationship. I was finding myself questioning stuff yeah. about who I was, yeah. um, identity stuff. And and I think it just articulated it so perfectly. And I was in an environment with someone who, you know, Dan in real life is a friend as well and, and supportive um, in everybody kind of being their authentic selves. And I felt like it was the first time I was able to figure out who that was and be it. Like, I don't love that I even need to or say that I identify as pansexual. I just, yeah. like, like what I like. If yeah. I change my mind, I'll change my mind. Yeah. But I understand why it's important at first for visibility and stuff and to, to find language for these things. Um to change culture. Because of that, the world has changed a bit. I think because of Shit's Creek and everything, the world has changed a bit more to being more like, we don't need to label things as much. You can just actually just be who you are. That's a beautiful thing. You were on Are You Afraid of the Dark? Yes, I was, twice, actually. Tell me a memory. I want to know something, because to me, I was in. I was on an island in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Anyone who was on uh, "Are You Afraid of the Dark" might as well have been uh, Richard Gere. I don't mm-hmm. know. Like it might as. I mean, it was a massive oh. deal. I don't know why that's my frame of reference in twenty twenty two. Yeah, that's Richard. Says a lot about you. What does that's it say great. about me? I don't know, but it means you know Pretty Woman. You're right. That's might be it. Which that I like be because I reference Pretty Woman now, and some people don't even know it. What's your favorite Pretty Woman line of reference? Oh, um, uh, three thousand. Or, um, uh, mine's broken. Or, um, 
There's a lot. You don't want me to do this. Well, you're, you're killing it just <laughs> now. Right now. I felt transported. I felt like Richard Gere. <laughs> Give me a, tell me a story about uh, Are You Afraid of the Dark? I'm dying to know. Um, this is actually a true story. Um, it was my first part ever. I was playing the girlfriend of um, the guy. It was a two-parter episode, Tale of Cutter's Treasure. And I had to kiss the boy like, and I wanted to be very professional. Um, so I went up to the director and I was like, so what kind of kiss would you like? Do you want with tongue, without friend? And his face was like that. Now we have things, intimacy coordinators for that kind of stuff. But um, So you went to him and said, should I do open mouth? Yeah. Open mouth with tongue? Open mouth without tongue? Yeah. Peck? And you know what? He didn't even answer me. He was just like your face was. and um, And he was like, well, we'll just... Whatever you feel comfortable with, and um, I just wanted to give the director what he wanted. So then, I mean, your, your career goes on. I mean, you have this in incredible uh, career, and then, but as you said earlier, you know, Schitt's Creek really does. It really did feel like it changed things. And what I really loved about it was that it felt, honestly, it felt like it it wasn't supposed to happen. You know, not to be a bad Canadian here. Oh no, no, that is a great way of putting it because no one was into it until it was over. <laughs> like, yeah. it became popular. Like, it, it, you know, when I signed on to it, I was signing on to a show with Eugene Levy and Catherine O'Hara. Like, this, we all thought it was going to be huge. And it, it wasn't at first. Like, people liked it a bit in Canada, um, a little more in the States. And uh, we did six seasons of it. Uh, because we did it with the CBC and they supported it, I know that Dan tried to sell the show in the States before that. Nobody wanted it. And um, we wouldn't have gone for six seasons had it not been with the CBC because it wasn't popular enough to go that many seasons. Um, but they supported it, supported Dan's vision, and then it was over. And then COVID happened and Netflix happened and then everybody watched it and loved it and... Um, all of a sudden, it won Emmys, and me and Annie and everybody didn't have jobs. <laughs> they didn't have day jobs. <laughs> well, no, we ended the show. We oh, were you didn't like, have jobs. Done. I, like, I didn't had day jobs. No, we that. didn't have day. No, but we were. It was just so. It was kind of very Shit's Creekian in retrospect. It was so great to suddenly be at the SAG Awards, and Nicole Kidman wants to take our, our picture with us, and and for us, like. We loved the show. We loved doing it, but it wasn't that popular it, for most of its run. When did you know it had sort of broken through? When did you know it, 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 was, it had hit another level? I mean, there's a few stages. One of them for me was when people named their dog Stevie and naming dogs and, and babies after character in a show. That felt like that was a milestone. But I think it was when I was shooting a show in Scotland and we had all been in quarantine wearing masks and everything. And I went outside and I had taken my mask off walking around and I got this for the first time. <gasps> and this is me like pointing and gasping. Um, Excellent radio uh, just then. Incredible. Thanks. Yeah. I, you know, actually, yeah. Are You Afraid of the Dark? wasn't my first job. I did radio dramas for the CBC. No. Yes, I did with and with footstep guy behind and door slamming. Yeah. What I, what what radio drama was it? I mean, I did a couple of them. I can't even remember what they were called, but um I went into that CBC building wow. with um, Casey and Finnegan. With Mr. Uh, Dressing? Yeah, yeah. There was that. And, oh, that cafe, that Ooh La La cafe, which maybe it's not there. It closed down a little while ago. Oh. There was Ooh La La, and then it got replaced by another cafe, which we called New La La. Oh, that's funny. Thank you. And, <laughs> then, and then that went away. That went away. It was so <sighs> And I remember going in they there and there was a little mail cart. They did. Yeah, they blamed you yeah. when they had to shut down. She said, she's not here anymore. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that makes sense because I would go there even when I wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I'd just go to that for their Nanaimo bars. Do you remember any lines from your CBC radio drama days? Oof, no, I, I don't at all. I don't even remember what they were about. I remember mostly just standing with a mic and there was a fake door behind me that someone would open and close and it was and and some rocks in a tray that a guy would just like step in and make sound and I was like that's a great job we had to lay off all those rocks 
<laughs> it was sad. Yeah. Well, they used to have a mail cart, like a little robot mail cart. They the mail robot, which was a real thing. Yeah. That used to drive around drive the CBC. Drive around the CBC. I can't believe I'm talking to you about this. Uh, <laughs> it, it retired a little while ago. The mail robot. It uh, and then we had, but, but we had a party for it. Oh my god! Yeah. Why wasn't I invited? You guys didn't. It didn't end we well. Didn't... So where is that robot now? I'll, I want to buy that robot. Imagine if I opened the door and it comes oh my God, beeps I would in, die. drops off a letter. I would die. Uh, so hold on. So you're, you're, you're in Scotland shooting the thing and someone gasps. And oh, yes. You, yeah. Yes. Sorry. Uh, gasps and... Um, it was the mail robot. It was the mail <laughs> 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 Oh, this is amazing. Um, and when Stevie. Uh-huh. And it was just this like... it Because at first the... the sh- thing of seeing somebody pointing at you and in shock was terrifying to me. I was like, what's on me? What's wrong with me? Um, but it was that kind of reaction that, um, and then just being recognized in that way and not so much in the way that I was used to, which was, you look like that girl who gives that guy the towels or motel girl. Have you seen this show? You look just like her. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a different kind of recognition. Yeah. Remember, or, remember yeah. On the other side of things, I've, I've talked to Annie Murphy, who was in the show with I love you. Annie so much. Um, I, I've talked to Dan, who created the show. I talked to Noah Reed. Do you like them all better than who, me? Who was in the show. I wouldn't say better. Uh, <laughs> different. Different. No, no, I'm only joking. They all, they, each of them said to me that, they, when the show ended and then the show took off, they felt a certain pressure after that. Hmm. Yeah, that I mean, that does make sense. Is that, did um, you feel that at all? Well, I felt, uh, I felt a real kind of postpartum with the show because at this, I was also doing another show at the same time um, called 12 Monkeys, which was a sci-fi um, uh, time travel drama. And um, and I was allowed to do two shows because my when I first signed on to Shits, it was just a Canadian show. And my agent at the time was like, I don't want you only bringing towels on on a show that's not that's just going to be in to- in Canada and you're going to just be bringing towels because we'd only read the first script and so she made it that I could do another show if it didn't conflict and so I got this show 12 monkeys and I was doing them kind of back to back and then the last season I would shoot shits during the day and 12 monkeys at night you're kidding me because they did conflict and so when I ended shits I was ending shits and 12 monkeys and I felt like I had nothing to live for Really? Well, it was just so all-consuming that that Shits was three months that we'd shoot, and but Twelve Monkeys was the other side of that for me, and so I felt like suddenly like everything ended, um, and I felt the pressure to not only like how what other job could ever give me everything that both those shows at the same time gave me. Like I got to do this comedy playing Stevie who was like taking a vacation from myself behind the desk. And then Jennifer on 12 Monkeys was, I don't know if you've seen the original, um, the movie 12 Monkeys yeah, with Brad. So yeah. I played the Brad Pitt part and mm-hmm. he, she's a crazy person. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was just, what will I ever get that will satisfy those, that, that kind of work? Is that why you started writing the graphic novel? No, but partly, I guess, because so I'm a workaholic. <laughs> Let me name it. Uh, Amelia Airwood, Basic Witch, mm-hmm. is, is Emily Hampshire's graphic novel. So you're a workaholic. But it must give you something that acting doesn't. Oh, yes. That's why I started writing and started creating my own stuff. And the, and the graphic novel did come, come out of doing that stuff more, um, which definitely came from wanting to be in control of... of everything (laughs) but like just to to not have to get a job to make the job i want um let me let me close off this way i think that the end of sex the movie that we're here to talk about until we started talking about the mail robot (laughs) sorry it's my fault um is is about more than just sex and sexual proclivities and and all that in some ways it's about getting older Mm -hmm. and Trying to recreate, I knew I knew a fella. He told me a story one time that when he was, him and his wife weren't getting along and they were going to break up, 
and he, it was a stupid idea. But what he decided to do was he looked at a picture of their first date. It makes me sad to think about it. And he wore the same clothes that they wore on the first date to try and like, because in his mind, I guess he wanted to re-spark, mm -hmm. start all over again. And I remember he said to me, he said, yeah, but you know, just you can't go back there. You can't go back. You can't go back to anything. To me, the movie is about that. The movie mm -hmm. is about trying to relive your 20s and your, and your 30s a little bit, but realizing that the time has passed and, and, and beautiful things await. How did making this movie make you reflect on that? Because I can see you nodding away. Oh, yeah. That's just a, it's, you just articulated that so beautifully. And it's so true that that is what it's about. And it reminded me that, like, even as an actor, the worst thing you can do is, like, when you do a great take and it's really great, try to recreate that. Um, and it is that thing in this movie that, they are at first trying to recapture what they had and not what they do realize at the end is that we're different people now. And like to go on that journey, which is so lovely about the movie. Um, I actually just like got goosebumps and I love the way you articulated it because that really is it. And, and you can relate to that personally. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. All those... It's, it's also finding the joy in the new thing yeah. and not, um, I mean, anything trying to live in the past is brings with it a depression of sorts and anything yeah. in the future is some anxiety of yeah. sorts. And it's that present, like accepting that present moment that you're in um, and their parents and they have these wonderful kids and like that can, you can have a a new sex life, a new different like, but like trying to be what you were is never gonna, never gonna be as good. But the next chapter could be better. Uh, I I can ap appreciate that in, in not just in the context of the movie and these people, but in the story you told me today about your own career. You know about about staying in the present and understanding that the next chapter could be better, mm -hmm. uh, and not wishing to have something back that was. Uh, really lovely to finally get a chance to talk to you. Nice to talk to you. I'm sorry I went on 75,000 different tangents. Um, but I I thank you for you. following me. Wasn't I there? Wasn't I there? You with totally you on the were. Wasn't I, was I on like, the, the side of the TTC well, there the, with you? You were, and you fueled it. So this is mostly your fault. So, anyways. <laughs>